Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, He was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as He does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the Word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what He said, how to cooperate with His kingdom, so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with Him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. You guys ready to get in the Word of God this morning? Yes. All right, so I want to talk, as always, when I start, I want to talk about Pastor Joe for a second. Woo-hoo. Somebody's happy. No, no stories. How many of us enjoyed his Kingdom Life and Culture series this, this, this summer? Okay, well, I have an image of what he did through the whole series, specifically last weekend's. Do you guys know what that is? My sister does. Okay, so these were really popular in the late 90s. They're called Magic Eye. I'm not casting a voodoo spell. Don't get weird. That's just the name of the book. So what they do is there's these images, and they look like a bunch of blue squares. But if you focus your eyes, there's an actual image in there, and you have to focus your eyes the right way. So if I focus my eyes on that screen, I'm going to use this one because that one's too close, it's too big. So there's a sailboat right in the middle of that image. If you can see it, you're going to have your masts right here, you're going to have your sails, you're going to have the front of the boat here, the back of the boat there. How many can see that image? There is? There's a pointer? Where? Oh, it is greed. (laughs) So you'll have the mast right here, front of the boat here, back of the boat here. How many can see that image? One person. A lot of people read the Word of God the same way. They have it right in front of them, but they don't know how to interpret or how to read it, so they're looking at a blank image without getting the revelation of what it actually is. Pastor Joe took the Holy Spirit, changed it, so rather than seeing a bunch of squares, you see the image of who the Holy Spirit is. He got rid of the mystery of praying in tongues. He got rid of the mystery of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So now when you open the Word of God to read about the Holy Spirit, based off what he taught all summer, you should be able to totally understand, maybe not everything to start, but understand the Holy Spirit will teach you what you're reading. And if you haven't watched that series, go on the YouTube page for the church, God's and Harvest Christian Church. And just watch that series, specifically last weekend. I watched that. um, It was a really good service. Uh, My wife and I, we went to Yellowstone. So we were out in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming for the week. So we missed it, but I watched it later on on the YouTube. And just everything he teaches, like he said, he wanted last week to be a service you could use as a reference guide. So if you're tired of looking at the Bible like that and not seeing the image of what it means, watch his series and he'll he'll teach you and show you how to work with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Pastor Dennis is still trying to see the sailboat, aren't you? (laughs) (laughs) They work for me. I love them. I I thought of this last night because they were house sitting for my parents. I was getting all my hunting gear out. But then I saw the book sitting on the floor, and I'm like, that's a great analogy. So I want to move on, and today what we're going to talk about is give me that faith. It wasn't supposed to sound like family feud, but it kind of does, Um, which is fine. I think Steve Harvey is the best family feud host there's ever been, uh, in my personal (laughs) opinion. He just cracks me up. But I want to talk today about faith, what it does, why it's important, but how to operate in it, the basics. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God, and without faith, you're going to have a very miserable life as a Christian. But with faith, you're able to have heaven on earth. Amen? Amen. So Mark 11, 22 through 23, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I could have just ended that verse right there, but I decided to move on. 
For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Have faith in God. Speak it out. I could close the service right there and we could all go home. <laughs> you guys got really happy about that. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. Jesus heard that too, so have fun with that one. But remember, what Pastor Joe teaches on this, what I love about this, it's not a matter of just moving the mountains, it's moving the power of God through your words. When you speak, you're supposed to shift the power of God into your situation. And there's two examples I'm going to use today in the Old Testament specifically, which shows us we have better promises than they did because they were servants back then, we're sons and daughters. How much better family heritage do we have compared to them? And they lived great lives. They were blessed. They were saved. They were counted faithful, but it was all temporary until Jesus came. But Jesus was here, and he died, and he's still alive today. So my favorite story, if you probably just saw that, so but it's all good. My favorite story in the whole Bible, who knows what it is? There you go. My wife knew. No one else saw that slide. Awesome. David and Goliath. And what I love about David is the boldness he had in God as a servant. He had more boldness as a servant than we see most Christians have as sons and daughters. So the first example I'm going to use today is David. Then he took his staff in hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had and his sling was in hand and he drew near the Philistine. Do you know why he took five stones? He had four brothers. You hit one brother, the other four are more likely than not coming. Notice he didn't take 10, he didn't take 15, he didn't take 20. He took one for everyone because he knew God was going to deliver him. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. This whole image of David and Goliath is Jesus. This whole image is what Jesus did for the church. Everything was coming against him on the cross. Everything was coming against him when he was put into that tomb. But on that third day, he became alive and well, and he's still alive today. I swear, you could just shout, Jesus is alive, and the whole service is over. <laughs> and the Philistine said to David, come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. If you're a man and you are at a men's retreat this past June, the theme of the uh, retreat was Goliath has a big mouth. Goliath right here has a big mouth, and he needs to be shut up. And this was going on for quite a while, but none of the Israelites took control of what they could have until David found out what was going on. But David understood something I would say no one else did. He understood the covenant God made with Abraham. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword, with the spear, and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord, who will do it? The Lord, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Okay, he's pretty bold. Goliath was a really big guy. David didn't sound like he was too big himself, but he knew the second he put God's name on the situation, God took over. So why do we put God's name on the situation and then we take over? And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know the Lord is not saved with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. Just thank the Lord we did that song at the end of service. I didn't even plan this, guys. 
and he will give you into our hands. David understood promise. He understood covenant. He understood God was going to deliver. Who is this Philistine? Somebody's got to shut him up. David spoke and acted on what he said in faith. The second he put God's name on the matter, the fight was no longer his. This should be a relief for some people because rather than fighting your battle, you put God's name on it, you get to go to sleep in the back of the boat while everybody else is terrored. Is that a word? (laughs) You get to enjoy the promises of God while everybody else is freaking out. One of my favorite verses, there was a time I was a very anxious person. Um, Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for nothing. Therefore, through fire and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ. I swear, <laughs> anything could happen. And I'll be like, okay. Because <laughs> I stood on that verse for so long, and I quoted it, and I quoted it, and I quoted it, and I went over, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and it got so far on the inside of me, I don't worry really about much. doesn't mean I don't care. I care, I don't worry, and there's a big difference between carry or, uh, caring on providing for your family and worrying that it's not going to happen. I don't worry about much. I can honestly say that. Because that so got on the inside of me because I realized God's taking care of everything. People are losing their minds. People are talking about this. People are talking about Ukraine, Russia, America. You're talking about uh, politician speeches this week and all this and that and this and this and that. Jesus is Lord. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's in control. All the power is his anyways, so let's treat it like he belongs where he is. David knew his talent was not his. Rather, a tool he could use to give back to God. Pastor Joe used this uh, maybe about a year ago. Pastor Joe said, I don't have hobbies. I have talents. I don't have skills, I have talents, and those talents were given to me so I can give them back to the kingdom of heaven. Do you know how fast a rock goes out of a sling? Up to 100 miles an hour. You have a rock going 100 miles an hour straight to somebody's forehead, you let me know how that works out for them. But that means David was skilled, and he was trained, and he practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced. As a shepherd, he practiced more, and he practiced more, and he practiced more. And he had more experience with the sling than some people do in the Word of God. But he knew just because he could use it for what he practiced for, he knew he could use it to deliver Israel. He could give that skill set back to the Father. What do you have in your life that you're really good at? We all have something. My wife brought up a really good point this week. People will be like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not a creative person. How? Yeah, people will say that. My wife is very creative. <laughs> very. She's the decorator of the house. I'm the doer. <laughs> Where was I? People will say they're not creative, but how can you say you're not creative if you were made in God's image and he created the universe? Maybe if you feel like you're not creative, you should spend time with him who created everything, and then you'll get the ideas and the inspirations, and then you could take the talent of creativity you didn't even know you had, give it back in some way, bless churches, bless homes, bless people in some way, and then watch how the Lord takes care of you in your private life. That's what's supposed to happen. I told my wife when I got my pilot's license, about 15, 10, 15% of me getting my license was for myself. Because flying is pretty cool, actually. It's quiet. Most of the time, there's no traffic. (laughs) But why do I want to have a skill like that and just keep it to myself? And the whole time I was getting my license, I was thinking how I could bless other people. So I determined, now, I have work to do, so don't call me tomorrow. Because I will, I'll answer the phone, but I'll tell you no. But this is my dream with aviation. You ready? Pastor Dennis, say you have family in Albuquerque, just because I like to say the name. 
And, uh, you know, there's a family emergency in Albuquerque. Do you know how stressful it is to buy a plane ticket the day of to fly somebody when you're already in an emergency? Unless your wife's doing it in the front row buying you a plane ticket. It's kind of easy at that point. Well, what if somebody who's a pilot and has the equipment and the talent can call you and say, I heard what happened. Here's a free plane ride across the country. Everything's on the house. It would be neat. It's going to be neat. But I don't want to keep things to myself. Pastor Joe doesn't want to keep things to yourself. You shouldn't want to keep things to yourself either. If God gave them to you, give it back to him, and then he'll just keep throwing more at you. Newsflash, you cannot outgive God. I challenge you to try. It's not going to work, and you'll be happy you tried. <laughs> I would say, and I said this at the men's retreat, a lot of people want a David experience with an Israelite mentality. The Israelite army, they were trained, they were soldiers, they had the gear, they had the tools, but they didn't have the promise in their heart. By every natural means, they had what they needed to defeat this one individual. I don't care how big somebody is. If a whole army goes after them, they're done. Unless God is on their side. God was not on the Philistine side. And while the whole entire army of Israel was hiding and fearful of this one loudmouth individual, one person rose up. Every generation has certain people... I want to make sure I say that right. Every generation has people in it that can be the next David, that can be the next Oral Roberts, the next Brother Hagen, the next Copeland. All those people, have you all have the capability to be there. So why can't it be you? Why can't you be the one who locks yourself away for years and years and years? God sees you faithful, counts it, and says, you know what, now I can use you. Here's preaching in front of two million people. Why not? Give me one good reason. Okay, good. There was silence. <laughs> you know, every generation has that, and I love sharing that message with teenagers and young adults because you don't know who the next Billy Graham is. You don't know, ne you don't know who the next Brother Hagen, the, the next Oral Roberts, the next uh, Smith Wigglesworth. We don't know, but God knows, and if we put the work in to experience the Father the way they did, Maybe we could get the results that they had. And they have two things. All those guys have two things in common. They fasted and they prayed. They didn't go to quick help seminars. They didn't go to seminars on how to, get a pro how to be a prophet. They didn't go to seminars on um, do these three. I read an article one time. It was 10 ways to tell if you're a prophetic intercessor. What? <laughs> Why don't you shut off the internet, shut yourself up, go read the Word of God for years on end and find out what He says your calling should be, not a 10 question your article on the internet. The McDonald's mentality can creep its way into life, and then we get frustrated and say God's promises don't work when really you just weren't applying the right formulas. I would say a lot of people want a David experience with an Israelite mentality. News flash, you cannot have both. It's one or the other. You can live with one or the other. You cannot live with both. The choice is up to you. I can share what I want to share. I can share what the Lord gives me. Pastor Joe can share what the Lord share what the Lord gives him. But if you don't take it to heart and apply it and make it a reality in your life, you can't have both. We want you guys to have the the David experience every day. But you have to apply the word to your life. The other example I want to use, again, they're both Old Testament, is Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego. And the self-control I had to not play the bunny song from VeggieTales. <laughs> and I thought of you, Kyle. Kyle used to sing that song on the job site when I was working for his dad. 
And I know Ken's listening right now. He's probably shaking his head. But Ratchak, Meshach, and Abednego, they were also people who understood who God was when nobody else did. And I want to go through their story real quick. These are just two examples of people who were servants. What are we? (laughs) You're never letting that one down. I know you knew the answer. I really do. I just don't care. (laughs) So if these guys were servants, were sons and daughters, how much more better promise of protection, of life, of blessing do we have? Um, The one thing I was thinking of, servant, compared to uh, children, any of the original, the new one is trash. We made it through one episode and shot it off. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, anybody? Yeah, okay, great 90s show. Um, you had the butler, Jeffrey. You know, Jeffrey was a servant, but he lived in the same house. He had the same tools. He had, the same, he had all that, but he was not a child. So he was well taken care of, but he didn't have access to the family like the kids had. There are certain Jews, so I'm going to jump ahead of the story. So if you're not familiar with Rashak, Meshach, and Abednego, um, you have three people who know God, who understand his promises. Then you have King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden statue. Contrary to popular belief, it was not a golden bunny. Um, have you guys ever seen that episode of Veggie Tales? Because if you haven't seen it, this is going right over your head. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden image, and at the sound of all the instruments playing, you were supposed to drop everything you were doing and worship that image. And if you didn't worship that image, he was going to get so mad, he was going to throw you in a fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who you have said over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men to the king. When you stand your ground in the word of God, people are going to get mad. Don't let somebody's instinct reaction of anger let you change your position of where you stand. They stoned Stephen with the gnashing of teeth because they were so angry. They were slamming the hands over the ears. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. But he did not change his conviction. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? They could have lied and gotten out of it. Now, if you are ready, he's still giving them another chance. I wonder how tempted they were, or if they were at all, to be honest, because they knew their God. When you know your God, you'll be faced with situations. Faith in God will make you do things other people will think you're crazy. But we just go sleep in the boat like Jesus did. And everything's taken care of. At the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and saw... How do you say that? Salt Salt shaker. And symphony with all kinds of music. And you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar was making himself God over their God. There was another individual who tried to do that, whose name was Lucifer, and it did not end well for him. It's a good thing to the believer when somebody challenges your God because my God's going to pull through and prove him wrong every single time. When you have faith in knowing that he provides everything, safety, he gives you everything according to his riches and glory, you can have a response just like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this matter. They didn't even want to answer the guy because he was such an idiot. They knew their God. One of the best conversations I like to have with Glenn Karam right over there is people knowing their God. 
He under, Glenn understands you need to know your God. And when you know your God, when you know Jesus personally, your life cannot stay the same because Christianity is Jesus Christ's life on in the inside of you. And if he's on the inside of you, how can we stay the same we were five years ago? Unless we've been lazy. And that, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. That's a pretty bold statement for what's about to happen. They were servants for sons and daughters. But if not... Let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And there's a common idea with verse 18 on how they start. They say, but if not, remember, you can't have a David mentality or an Israelite mentality with a David experience. God will deliver us if he doesn't. Deliver if not. Deliver if not. It, does, it sounds like they would be giving themselves an out. It sounds like a modern day faith prayer. We're going to believe God for healing, but if he doesn't, it was his will. We're going to believe God for provision, but if it doesn't, I'm going to put another 10 hours in. Maybe instead of putting 10 hours in at work, God wanted you to put 10 hours in your basement praying in tongues and reading the word to find out how he was going to provide for you in the first place. So what you would have made in 10 hours working, he'd give you 10 times that. Just a thought. Is your faith in Nebuchadnezzar, your affairs, or the Father? If you go back, nope. you have set over the affairs of the province. They had jobs. They had job security under the king. If you work under the king, you're probably taken care of really well. And it's not wrong to work hard. You need to. You're supposed to. God designed us to work. But if your work becomes your God over God providing your needs, that's when it's an issue. And they weren't giving themselves an out by saying, well, even if he doesn't know what they were saying, we're not going to do that. But even if he wouldn't save us, we still want to bow to you because we know he's real and you're not. They weren't giving themselves an out. They were reaffirming their faith and who God was in their life. They knew him personally. They knew the covenant. They knew the promise. It's the same concept. Well, if you, if you don't deny God, then I'm going to shoot you. Go ahead, shoot me. I'm still not going to worship. I'm still not going to serve you. Oh, and if he didn't save me, I'm still not going to do it anyways because I'd rather be dead with him than living knowing I rejected who he was. There was a lot of slides. Is your faith in Nebuchadnezzar, your affairs, or the Father? Nebuchadnezzar tried to get them to shift their faith into him. He tried to get them to think, we got to do what he says if we want to be safe. We got to do what he says if we want to be taken care of. We got to do what the people in power say if we want to be protected. God's my provider. He's my protector. I'm going to serve him. I'm not going to trust in any other system except the word of God. If the past couple years proved anything, it proved that everything else can fall. That everything else can change and falter and everything else. It really is. When it's man-made, it, it's weak. But the word of God stands forever. And if your faith is in the word of God, you're going to be just fine. So as Pastor Joe says, why don't we turn off Fox News, CNN, all those industry, all those news media, and just get in the word to find out what he says. I was listening, who was I listening to? I listen to a lot of people. Anyways, on YouTube, you know you have the side bars of like next videos and they're total clickbait. You're like, oh, I'm going to watch this one two minute video. Six hours later, you're still watching videos. Okay. Well, I saw one by uh, a gentleman, his name is Mario Murillo. And the caption on the, uh, on the side, and I don't get caught up in all of this. I really don't. It was like November 2022 prophetic word of what's coming. I'm like, okay, I'll set the hook, I'll go. <laughs> so I clicked on it, I started, and the whole video was about how you need to get in the word of God and find out what he says about your life in this time. I'm like, you did that really well. 
I fell for it, and I knew I was falling for it. But when our faith is in the word of God and nothing else, nothing else matters. When your faith is in, I'm not going to be anxious for anything, but by everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, I'm not going to be anxious over anything. And I don't get anxious over much anymore. Do I? Unless somebody cuts me off, or I'm like overwhelmed in the moment. That's a little different. I mean like life situations I don't get anger. I get tested. <laughs> We're all from New England. We all know the truth. <laughs> they did not have doubt and they were not giving themselves an out. They were fully ready to go through with everything regardless of the outcome. Are we? See, real faith is being in the middle of the ocean on the little piece of ice that Will Ferrell and Elf came to the shore on with no other way out. <laughs> I got some chuckles. Real faith is being stranded with no other way out except the Word of God. A lot of faith, Jim Hoggett taught this, a lot of faith, you're believing for healing on this leg, but this leg is right here to jump back up in case it doesn't work. But what about when the doctors can't help you? I don't know why they're doing this to me, but on YouTube now, all the ads are St. Jude Children's Hospital, and it's all cancer. I think cancer. But you know what? At least St. Jude is trying. At least they're doing work to help those children. Where are the sons and daughters of God who get in the word and read verses on healing over and over and over and over and over and get it on the inside of them so that they can step into that hospital, put their hand on that child, just like that they're healed, full head of hair and everything in an instant. Who says that can't happen? And if you tell me it can't, we will have a great conversation. But that's the power of the God that we serve. I see these children and these parents are hurting. And there's one individual I saw online. And the parents have accepted the child's death sentence of an illness. And they're not believers. And I hate it because I know that child can live and not die. I know that the power of God can as easily heal him of that as it could of my headache. But you need to be the vessel the Lord needs. Going on, and then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They said, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth of the form, and the form of the fourth, fourth is like the Son of God. When Jesus shows up, people know who he is. Are you having him show up in your life so people can see who he is? Nebuchadnezzar, he was a king. He, two or three verses earlier, was putting himself above God, and now he's saying this one is the son of God. When they have an encounter with Jesus because of your faith, people's lives will change. Maybe let's stop arguing with people and have experience with Jesus be their witness. I love having encounters with Jesus. I love working with him. I love when he ministers to people, whether through me, around me. I don't care. I don't have to be the spokesperson. I just want people to have Jesus. And it's funny when you're talking to people you don't know and they're having one of those encounters with who Jesus is in your life and their lives change because they can't deny it. I had two very specific instances. I was talking to people. One of them was in prison. I was not in jail. I was visiting in a jail. I would just like to set that one out. We were uh, on a mission trip in prison in uh, Quito, Ecuador. You were there. That's right. You were there. That's where we met. Uh, so, sorry. We were in prison talking to these, talking to these, uh, these guys, and they weren't in prison for stealing a candy bar. One of them walked up to me for whatever reason. He said, I stabbed somebody 15 times out of a club because he stole money from me. Out of the blue, I said, okay. Poker face on point. 
Well, as I'm talking to a group of these guys, I see this one guy, his name was Hector. He was right over here, kind of with his head tucked down. And I kept looking at him. And I'm talking to a group, but I keep seeing him. And I tell the group, I say, excuse me, real quick, I got to go talk to this guy. And the Holy Spirit threw me, I can't do this. I cannot turn it on. I cannot turn it off. This is not me. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through me. This is all Jesus, okay? So I start talking to him, and I start telling things to him about his life, what his mother said to him, what his friends did to him, how he ended up where he was. Detail after detail, and the look on his face I'm just a white guy from New Hampshire. How does he know any of this? And I prayed for him. I said, if you let me pray for you, God will show up and all this anxiousness and hurt you have will go away like that. When you speak like that and pray for people, watch the results. It's great. I said, will you let me pray for you? And he said, yes. So I prayed for him. He broke down, started crying. The power of God just boom. Then I went back to the other group, and I still kept looking at him. And I said, excuse me, to the group again, I went back. And I said, Hector, and this is all with the translator. Okay, I'm in Ecuador, it's a Spanish-speaking country. I can do like three words. I can ask where the bathroom is, because that was my favorite sentence in high school, because I didn't want to be there. And I went up to the individual again. I said, if you want to know who this piece comes from, you can meet him. And I started telling him about Jesus and what he did, and he got born again that night in that prison because I had experience with Jesus to have him have an encounter. His life was changed from that instant. I'll probably never see him again until I get to heaven, but when I get there, I know we're going to talk, we're going to hang out, and we're going to reminisce about what happened. Yeah, he was under 18, had a kid, everything. Rejected by everybody. Born again, like that. Now he's a son of the Most High God. And I love those encounters. Because how can you deny somebody greater than me is telling me, and I didn't charge for it. I don't want to. A, we're commanded not to. But if it was given to me for free, why would I want to charge somebody and make money off it? That's how you make God really mad. Freely given, or freely receive, freely give. Those are the experiences and the encounters that I love having. There was another individual. I just love sharing stories. You guys have told me you like my stories, so I'm just going to share stories. Um, Longer story short, we were talking. It was in the church cafe probably five, six years ago, and I told this individual they never said this out loud, ever. Again, this is Jesus speaking, not me. I said, the Lord knows you want to be married. You want to have a boy first when you have children. You want your boy to have blue eyes and brown hair. Their jaw hit the floor. It's a word of knowledge. It's Jesus. It's not me. I said, how would I have known that? Well, God must have told you. Well, then Jesus is real, right? You want to meet him? They got born again that night too. Because when Jesus shows up, people know who he is. Are you having encounters with Jesus for people to see him on you? Jesse Duplantis says it best, the the closest thing to Jesus that people will see is the Jesus in you and the Jesus in me. Do they see Jesus in you? We're going to close here in a minute. Building our faith. I'm really liking getting okay-ish with the slides, like in all the pictures. I'm not as good as Pastor Joe, but I'm like really trying. I really am. Building our faith. I was never a mason or anything like that, but the image looked cool. So building our faith. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, Romans 10, verse 16. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How does faith come? Where does hearing come from? But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. But if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, why are we told to pray in tongues to build our faith? 
How many of you can answer that? Pastor Joe taught on this last week. Should at least be one hand in here. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, building yourself up on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. Lacey. There she goes. That's my wife. We did not rehearse this. <laughs> Praying in tongues allows you to understand the mysteries, the things that are difficult to understand about God's in the natural mind. You pray, it opens, it shuts your mind off temporarily, prays through your spirit, then the Lord is able to reveal things in his word. Ten theologians all lined up, as Pastor Joe said last week, could never understand it in a thousand years. If a 10-year-old understands praying in the spirit and building up their faith and how to receive the revelation, a 10-year-old can outsmart in the spirit any Plato, Aristotle, any of those guys stand nothing against somebody who has a revelation when God is teaching them. It's a lot easier to have faith in the word and have faith in God when God himself is the one teaching and downloading the things on the inside of you. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But we're supposed to pray in tongues to build our faith. We're supposed to pray in the Holy Spirit. What if you combine both at the same time? Same exact time. You can read and pray in the Spirit at the same time. Your spirit, holy, praying in tongues is praying in your spirit. Reading is your mind. They're two completely different vessels. You can read and pray at the same time. And you combine them. So again, we can go in more. I keep looking for that clock. I have the digital one. I just haven't. I haven't been here. I was on vacation. It's all my fault. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. How do we build our faith? How does that work? Aside from what Lacey said, because I'll give you the answer. How does praying in tongues build up your faith? Tune in last week. <laughs> Go watch Pastor Joe's service. And you'll be able to answer that just fine. He gives us the tools in the word of God to understand him as a father and have a relationship with him. Those servants understood relationship. I want to understand more than I do sonship. Inheritance. Be in the word, continually reading, meditating in the word, praying in your spiritual prayer language. If you're not familiar with that, you haven't heard of it much, or, or you're not sure if it's, if it's for today, Pastor Joe did a whole series this summer on that. If you go on our YouTube, um, Kingdom Culture, Kingdom Life and Culture, it's all there. And he lays it all out just fine. And he answers, how does that build up our faith? Tune in last week. I think that was a good cliffhanger. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, except for the ones we were here last week. Well, there were no hands up, so. Um, well, amen. I'm done. This is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.